The push for greener energy has driven the price rallies for commodities such as uranium and copper this year. But is that momentum set to continue? Joining us now to discuss is Craig Hutchison, Director for Equity Research at TD Cowan. For full disclosure on the companies covered by TD Cowan, please see the link to the website at the end of this program. Craig, welcome back to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me back. We have had a very interesting, I think, run in several key commodities since you were yes. last on the program. I want to break some of them down. Bit of a green energy theme for some of them. Let's start with uranium. Yeah, no, it's been a very volatile Q2. So, in, in fact, for, for uranium, it's been a volatile for first half of the year. Um, uranium hit a 16-year high, $106 a pound back in February. Uh, since then, we've retreated. We're, we're back, back to around $85 levels right now. I think it's important just as you look at uranium to sort of stick, take a step back and kind of look at the macro. You know, late last year, you had that COP28 and the climate um, conference. And in the past, you know, nuclear really hasn't been part of that conference. It's really been more of a sideshow. And this year it took center stage and you had, I think it was 22 different countries pledge to triple nuclear capacity uh, by 2050. So it's a, it's a huge statement. That includes Canada, the US, all the key kind of Western countries. Obviously we know China is building out their nuclear fleet. Layer on the fact that you've had some supply disruptions out of Niger. I think most more recently, what's really interesting is you've had this bipartisan support in the US and there's been the, the banning of nuclear fuel from Russia, right? And Russia is a major contributor to the nuclear fuel industry. Uh, I think they're a little over 10% of the primary supply and close to 40% of all the enrichment capacity. So um, that's gonna be pretty disruptive to, to the market. Um, I think there are some people that expected the price to, to rally on the back of us, including, including ourselves. Um, but I think there's this just concern in the market and people are kind of waiting for it, whether the Russians will counter those measures and actually ban nuclear fuel immediately to the United States. Because right now, the U.S. utilities actually have to apply for waivers uh, to still acquire that Russian material, right? Because there, there's obviously contracts in place and they need that material. It's difficult to shift away. But over time, what I think you're going to see is those U U.S. utilities are moving away from Russia, move to Western sources. And obviously, that'll be positive, I think, for, for uranium prices that we see quoted today. Um, you understand also, you know, there's been some dynamics in the market, why it's been weak. The spot market, which is very thinly traded, right? Sometimes only 100,000 pounds can move the market several dollars. I can't dollars. a lot of participants in the uranium trade. Exactly. There are financial players, right? And there are financial players that have gotten involved. Um, but I think, obviously, Sprott's one of them, right? They've, they've helped drive the price up to, to the levels we've had. But we've had seen some, understand some hedge funds and other financial players have sold some material, which has caused some of the weakness. But I think as you look into the fall, summer months are usually typically um, poor months for trading in uranium. It's kind of the summer doldrums. As you go into the fall and the World Nuclear Association Conference in September, you're going to see, I think, activities start to pick up on the term market, which is really what the utilities trade in, right? And I think you'll see that. And I, hopefully, you'll start to see the price start to tick back up again here in the fall. It does feel like when you talk about uranium and the fact that nuclear is back in the discussion of the green energy push, that it's a longer term play as well. You do get these short term fluctuations and they have been dramatic. But as you look at, you know, five, 10 years, even beyond uh, the market, I guess, from the narrative today seems to have some support. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, like renewables are going to be a big part of the piece, right? You think of the solar, you think of the wind, but you know, the wind doesn't you know, always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, right? So there's a growing acceptance that nuclear is going to play a big part in that sort of stable grid power. And as you look further afield into, say, I would say the 2030s, small modular reactors or SMRs will become an increasing part of the, the picture, right? There's basically, those are like the term would suggest more modular. So the hope is that they cost less, they could be more like streamlined in terms of the, the building process of that. We're still a few years away from that. Um, but I think as you look to the future, the growth rate is gonna be somewhere in that three to 4% range, which is quite robust considering the history we've had here the last sort of 10 years. Okay, so that's uranium. Obviously another interesting commodity through the spring was copper. I felt like all these different commodities were taking their turns, making record runs. What happened with copper? So there was a, there was a short squeeze in May. Um, you saw prices hit 520. That's an all-time high. Um, it was it was quite temporary in nature. I would say that that sort of squeeze lasted a few days. Um, there was, from what we understand, some traders that were kind of left short material on the Comex. Um, and there's issues around again Russia again. There was some ban on terms of the material in the LME sitting in the London exchanges. So you you could take you couldn't take out that material and put it back on the Comex. So they were caught short, and that caused the the, the rally that we've seen. Um, and obviously prices have kind of pulled back from here. We're, you know, if you look long term, the, the copper market is still very strong, right? We've had supply constraints, and we can talk about this more, but some, some supply constraints over the last um, sort of nine to 12 months. 
um, and the demand growth profile going out is still 2 to 3% driven by electrification of vehicles, you know, solar, wind power, all these things that are very copper intensive. There has been some discussion around EVs perhaps not being in as, as firm of a demand as they were before, even though obviously they're still selling units and yeah. Tesla's latest numbers seem to be impressive. Well, what does that market, did, did that sort of affect the copper mindset for a bit there? I think the market's more been driven by supply disruptions. You know, we've had the Cobra Panama supply disruption and some, some cuts from Anglo-American as well. So, um, you know, EVs, certainly the adoption rate has been quite dramatic in China, but you're right, it has slowed. Um, so I think it's less of a factor, but as you kind of look towards the balance this decade, you know, that whole electrification thing is going to become huge. I think it's something in the order of 6 million tons of demand in a market that's around you know, 25 million tons. So it's, it's very material, um, but it's going to take a little bit of while to get there. Yeah, the demand is there, but are you, obviously we are having supply constraints and it's not as easy as just to turn on. I, I was having a discussion with a guest recently, say if you're talking about a commodity like wheat, well then a farmer just says, well next year I'll grow more wheat. We're not going to just suddenly yeah. take more copper out of the ground in six to 12 months. A bit of a challenge there? Yeah, no, it's, it's difficult to start these mines up. There's, there's a lot of political risk. There's a lot of factors that go into to, to building these mines and getting them on schedule on budget. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of disruption in terms of geopolitical issues and stuff like that, and obviously some protests around the Cobra Panama mine. So yeah, it's, it's, I think the supply is always the challenging thing to kind of figure out, right? Just in terms of those potential disruptions that you can get. Uh, so I think that's going to be a big part of the narrative going forward. All right, let's switch to another commodity now that had its run and its day in the sun as well. Silver, what was happening there? Yeah, so I think last time I was on the show, I talked about the potential for silver and gold to run, and that really is really on the view that interest rate cuts were coming. Uh, we still haven't seen them. We haven't seen them in the U.S. anyways. Um, I think what's been really been driving the market for silver and gold has really been purchases out of Asia, central bank buying, in particular China. Um, you know, silver is a cheaper metal than, than gold, so obviously there's, I think, been a trade down into the less expensive metals, so more purchasing of silver. And from what we understand, family offices and wealthy individuals in China, other places in, in Asia have been buying the metal. Uh, you know, if you, if you look forward, you know, interest rate cuts has always been a good time to own these precious metals, and we still haven't got there. So there's potential that we could see the upside from here when we, those cuts start to happen. All right, those are the commodities. What about the miners that take them out of the ground? What, what, what's the picture for them? Yeah, so Q2 is looking very, very strong from a margin perspective. Um, you know, copper is that the price for copper average in Q2 will be the second highest in history. So we should see margin expansion for, for copper. And similarly with gold and silver, uh, the gold price I think is up 13% quarter over cold, quarter and silver is up I think over 20%. So you're not seeing that kind of inflation bump quarter over quarter. So you will see margin expansion. You will see higher free cash flow in Q2. So it's, it's, it's a very nice setup as we go into the Q2 earnings reports for, for both copper and the precious metal uh, miners.